we have a great farmer friend here who's given us the opportunity to come and walk around in his fields. And you wanted to find a place where we could talk in the midst of kind of a lush vegetation. Yes. So I can't think of a, a better place to do that than here. I agree. Stuart, you've done a lot of amazing things. You've done a lot of great designs, even spacecraft, is that right? Yes, I've been designing for about 30 years, and I think spacecraft would be one of my favorite areas, certainly one of the most challenging because of the very severe environment you get in space. And it's really through spacecraft design, that's when I first found that design does not happen by chance. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes immense planning and precision uh, and purposeful design. And when I look at the creation around us, I see that purposeful design, purposeful design and beauty. So when you look at this uh, field of wheat, does that spur something in you as a design engineer? Yes. Wheat would be one example of the part of creation which is designed for man, but whichever part of creation I look at, whether it's birds or trees or plants or land animals, I see everything with a purpose for man, God's goodness in filling uh, the earth with all the provisions that man needs. So Stuart, when you read the, the details of the creation account, for example, in Genesis, do you see that as uh, details from a design standpoint and an engineering standpoint? To me, six-day creation uh, is totally compatible with what a designer would expect. In fact, the Bible says that God created the earth to be inhabited. Hmm. Now, if that was God's purpose, then it makes sense that creation would be made in a short period of time, like six days, because why would a creator wait billions of years if his whole purpose is to have life on the earth? But on the other hand, uh, it makes sense that it's not six seconds, that it's six days, mm -hmm. because God wanted to show man through the order of creation, through the process of creation, that the earth and man were at the center of his purposes in the universe. Mm. And I think in addition to that, God sets a wonderful pattern of a, of a seven day week, six days for working and one day is a day of rest. I think it's very humbling that God would build the universe in such a way that it would help our pattern of a working week. And it's interesting that wherever you go around the whole world, people have the same seven day week. And mm. it's hard for the atheist to think of a reason for that seven day week, but it makes complete sense if the Bible is true. Mm -hmm. Well, you also see a lot of systems associated with uh, the creation. Uh, let's kind of walk through this. What, what are those big systems that you see? For example, the first law of thermodynamics says you cannot create or destroy energy. But according to that, you can only have this world around us if there were some God to bring it into being. Mm -hmm. So that first law of th thermodynamics is completely compatible with six-day creation. And then you have the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy and disorder are always increasing in, in the universe. And therefore, you need an almighty power, you need a God to have put the order that we see in this universe. And interestingly, the first three days of creation, we see a separation taking place. On the first day, you have the separation of light and darkness. On the second day, you have separation of the waters below and the waters above. On the third day you have the separation of land and seas and separation is very much a process of bringing order into the universe because engineers often think of mixing as a disordering process. So it's interesting that on each day of creation you see God bringing matter into the universe and bringing order into the universe. So Stuart, these are like work days that we see God going through in each one of those days. So can you kind of step that through with me? What, what is he doing on each of those days? So on day one of creation, we see God creating the foundations of the earth. That makes sense from an engineering point of view. You start with the foundations. But God also creates two of the most important elements in the whole of the universe, light and water. And we now know that those two elements are very fundamental to life itself. What I find remarkable about light is the way that it can carry energy. Even here 
In Tennessee in April, we can feel the warmth of the sand on us. It's really That's good. nice. But when you think that warmth has traveled millions of miles through space, it's incredible. So light is very important. Uh, light also is one of the reasons we live in a very beautiful world because light contains all of the colors of the rainbow. And one of the wonderful things about the world we live in is that it has a very ideal color scheme. We see the blue sky, which contrasts with the green land. It'd be very strange if the sky and the land were both blue, but we have this lovely color scheme where you have a, a contrast, but not only that, but blue and green are both restful colors, uh, unlike red, for example, which raises the blood pressure. So it just so happens we, we have a good color scheme, and I think it's a much better explanation to say it's been designed. Mm. So there's light, but you're also talking about water in that first day. Yes, water is another one of these really important uh, aspects of creation. On the one hand, water seems like a very simple thing. It's got this big oxygen atom and two little hydrogen atoms. Looks simple, but water is like a miracle substance. It's so fine-tuned for making life possible. For example, water has an ideal specific heat capacity. That's a measure of how much energy it takes to change the temperature of water. And because it has a high specific heat capacity, that means that we can keep a stable body temperature. We don't vary too much, so it makes life possible. But also it keeps the temperature of the lakes and the sea stable as well, and that helps a stable weather system. So water is very well designed, but it's not just the specific heat capacity. Water also freezes top down in lakes and seas because of the way ice floats on water, which is a very unusual property for a liquid to have. But it's a very important property because the life would just die if it froze from the bottom up. So it freezes from the top down. So that's another uh, fine-tuned property of, of water. Well, I know on day two that God separated the water from the water. What, what was going on there? Well, on day two, God is making the water system and the air conditioning system. That's very similar to what an engineer does. An engineer, having made the foundations of a house, will make the water supply system, the drainage system, the supply system. So that's what we see on day two. And air is another one of these critically important substances, fine-tuned substances like water. Because, for example, air has just the right amounts of density. It's not so dense that we can't run through uh, the air. It doesn't slow us down when we walk and run. But it's dense enough that birds can fly, uh, aeroplanes can fly. So density is just right. But also God has put just the right amount of oxygen in the air. It's enough for us to live and breathe but it's not so much that fires spontaneously start. So God has designed this designer air system. It's also very convenient because air is transparent so we can see through it, but air can also transmit sound and transmit smell. As an engineer, I've worked with some of the best engineers in the world in Japan, America and Europe, and I've never met an engineer who could pack so much functionality into a substance like air. It, it's a miracle substance. One of the most amazing things about air is that it can absorb water. It's like a sponge and air is a very important part of the, the water cycle because when water vapour condenses, it can condense into clouds, then you get transport. The clouds can be taken from the sea to the land and then you have precipitation where the water droplets become big enough, gravity pulls them down to the earth, then they permeate through the ground and then water pressure can bring the water up again into springs and streams and rivers. What I love about the water system is that God has put local springs and streams everywhere on the land so that it doesn't matter where you are, you're normally not far from a stream or a river. I think that's an amazing mm. aspect of design that God can deliver fresh water very close to where you live. Yeah. It, it's fantastic design. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess not many of us spend enough time thinking about the water cycle and just the glory uh, of that whole system. Mm -hmm. So God has finished uh, day two, and now he moves into day three. That's where we first find life, isn't it? That's right. Having made the foundations of the earth and then made the water system, on day three, God makes all the provisions that man will need 
So on day three, God particularly makes food and it's the plants that will ultimately give food to the animal kingdom, it's the trees, the flowers, and the crops that will give us food. So day three is an important day, the day that finishes off the creation of man's home. And I, my guess is that from an engineering perspective, you're gonna look at the, even the plants and say, there's an exquisite design there. Yeah, plants look simple, but they are actually very complicated and engineers can't make even a blade of grass because that is just so complicated. And you can see that here with uh, wheat. If I bring up a, a stalk of wheat, uh, you can see here this lovely lush uh, green leaves mm. and the chlorophyll there is producing by photosynthesis food for the plant, glucose, and that food will ultimately become food for the animal kingdom. And that process of photosynthesis is an incredible process where uh, the chlorophyll in the plant converts water and sunlight and carbon dioxide into that glucose food. Uh, it's an amazing process that engineers can't replicate. Hmm. So even in the, in the simplest plant, we have a very highly complex engineering process going on. That's right. And if you uh, think of the whole plant itself, if you think of how a plant uh, starts as a tiny seed. The farmer gave us uh, these wheat seeds here. They're just tiny seeds. And yet the information is in there, in the genetic code, for that plant to grow. And when you think that that seed is just in the ground, surrounded by mud, and, and just from that soil, it brings in the nutrients it needs, the minerals like nitrates and phosphates, and together with water, and when it emerges from the soil, it has the sunlight and the carbon dioxide from the air. Just those simple ingredients can produce a beautiful flower or wheat like this or trees. It's an incredible thing to think that soil and water and air and sun are being converted into these exquisitely designed plants that are so useful for man. Mm -hmm. Well, Stuart, that makes me think of what I've just been working on <laughs> in terms of writing and the, the way that God created everything to be in relationships so that even the seed, if it's all by itself, doesn't really produce. It has to be in that relationship that God made it. Do you see that throughout uh, your design perspective of creation? Yes, the world is full of uh, amazing relationships where one part of creation is interrelated with another part. If you take plants, they're part of intricate food cycles. So plants are what's called producers. They produce glucose, which is important for the animal kingdom. Animals are consumers. You have primary consumers like mice. I, earlier today, I saw mice crawling yes, into this in field, field to steal the wheat, but then it as well as consumers, you also have decomposers like bacteria and fungi. So all three of those are dependent on each other, the producers, the consumers, the decomposers. And as well as the food cycles, you also have gas cycles as well. So plants are net producers of oxygen, animals are net consumers of oxygen, net producers of carbon dioxide, but then you need bacteria to produce nitrates that plants need. So you see all of these different relationships. In fact, we could go even further and talk about how plants need insects for pollination and insects need plants. And in creation, you have a myriad of these gas cycles, food cycles, and interrelationships between one part of creation and another. And I suspect, as an engineer, when you look at all of those pieces and parts that have to be in place, that's why you look at all of this and say it just could not have happened by random processes. Part of my research is systems design. And I remember from my spacecraft engineering, a spacecraft is a very complex system with lots of different subsystems. It's impossible to just evolve that bottom up. It has to be designed top down. It would be ridiculous to start with a nut and a bolt and a washer and expect a complex system to evolve. But this Earth has a far more complex system than a, than a spacecraft. Well, Stuart, I remember when I was designing software that, just as you said, we didn't start with a line here or there. We started with that 
overall design. And I understand right now you're working on a very, very interesting project. You're, you're working on something with Olympic biking, is that right? That's right, my current project is designing the transmission for the British Olympic cycling team for World Championships and Olympics. What we've done is to redesign their chain and their sprockets, the whole transmission system, to get a very high efficiency that's going to enable us to compete better with the American and the other <laughs> yeah. teams. I'm sorry about that, uh, well, that's fine. Dale. So we have highly optimized this transmission system. When we did that, we had to design it top down. That's, that's what an engineer does. That's what, how I teach my students the way you design is not to evolve step by step. I tell them you'll get nowhere mm -hmm. if you do that. Mm -hmm. The way you design properly is to design top down. You think of the overall functions, the overall system, then you plan the subsystems that will work together to produce the overall function. And only when you've laid out all the systems do you then design the components of those systems. And when you bring all the parts together, you have this fully functioning system. So what you see in a system like a bicycle transmission is an irreducible system where many parts are needed simultaneously for there to be a useful function. So the bicycle doesn't work unless they're all together. That's right. And if one link breaks, the cyclist doesn't go anywhere. Right. Everything's got to be functioning. It's just like my truck. Yes. <laughs> you and I just went through. One little piece goes wrong and it's dead. So we live in this very complex world with complex ecosystems, and complex substances like water and air, and everything is finely tuned. You'd only have to have a small change in one of the properties mm -hmm. of a substance like water and air, and the whole system breaks down. That's one of the reasons I think there's overwhelming evidence for design, yeah. because the world is far more complex than a bicycle or a spacecraft. There has to be a designer who put everything in place and fine-tuned everything. Well, Stuart, that brings us to these two paradigms because what you're saying from an engineering perspective is the paradigm that says everything uh, grew up from the bottom, so to speak, it evolved from the small pieces up, is actually the opposite of how you can design any system. That's right, and also I do research in design in the natural world. I've done research on trees, and birds and insects and the human body. And what I see in natural systems are the same kind of mechanisms that I see in engineering. Now in engineering, whether I'm designing gearboxes or bearings or structures, they're all irreducible designs. They cannot be evolved step by step. But I see each of those structures and mechanisms in the natural world. So I can't see any hope for evolution to produce anything that we see in, in this world by process of evolution. So just as we see in the plants around us, that process of photosynthesis, all of the pieces and mechanism of photosynthesis have to be there. Absolutely, a, a plant is an irreducible system because it needs to produce food to live, but it can't produce food unless it has the chlorophyll and the mechanism to produce by photosynthesis. So everything in that plant has to be together and there's no evidence of plants evolving step by step. And I wouldn't expect any evidence because you can't evolve that kind of complex system. So then if you step higher, even the plant itself has to have the sun and the earth and the nutrients and the water and the air for the cycle. It just becomes extremely more complex. So that brings us now then to the issue of the sun because we don't have that yet. How do you see that? Well, the Bible tells us that God is light. So God doesn't need to have a sun to produce light. On those first three days of creation, God was just producing light from his own person. And in fact, perhaps God was giving a message here that he didn't want people to think that light only comes from a sun. It was to illustrate that light fundamentally comes from God himself. Mm -hmm. But now the stars, you kind of think, man, they're so far away. What purpose do they fulfill? People ask about what is the purpose of the stars? I think there are several purposes. One is to proclaim God's glory. And mm. God has a lot of glory, so you need a lot of stars to proclaim that. Mm. Secondly, the stars are there for signs and for seasons. And it's a very humbling thing to think that God created the stars of the entire universe to give us a calendar system to help us know what time of the season it is. 
Thirdly, God created the stars for beauty, to give us a beautiful view. And this part of Tennessee, I think you get a very beautiful view of the stars at night. Mm, yes. And modern discoveries in astronomy have shown that the position of the stars is ideal to give us a beautiful view because there aren't so many stars in the sky that the sky is too crowded with stars, but there are not too few stars that we don't have a beautiful view. So God has given us this ideal position in the Milky Way galaxy to have this beautiful view of stars. But not only that, but our galaxy even has a very convenient and ideal position in the whole universe that we're not so far away from galaxies that we can't see them, but we're not so close to other galaxies that they give us too much light. So there are many lovely functions in, in the stars for the Earth. Mm -hmm. Well, we still have a couple work days left, and I know in those work days we're going to get to animals and birds and fish. So I think the best place to do that, Stuart, would be at Real Foot Lake. We need to go out on that lake, and I think you're going to find it amazing. That sounds a good idea. Yeah. Is that lake very famous? Well, it is in certain parts of the country uh, because it was formed in a really miraculous way. 